Thank you all. So I'm Art Papier. I'm a dermatologist, medical informaticist, and just a few words about the presentation. I, I'm, I'm not a software engineer. I don't write a line of code. My professional background is really thinking about information design. So in the 1980s, I had the good fortune as a medical student to meet Dr. Larry Weed. I'm wondering how many people know what he invented. Okay, great. And um, then moved to this town called Rochester, New York. And for the young people in the room, I, I think they might not remember this company called Kodak. They made this stuff called film. And uh, other people of my advanced age in the room, of course, know that Kodak had this incredible expertise in imaging science and color. And so I brought together with a team in Rochester um, the ideas of Larry Weed and problem orientation with um, some of the expertise in Rochester around imaging. So what we want to do is share first kind of the need for Visual DX and then talk about how we're using Fire. Uh, we're also uh, working with Cerner and Cerner really has been at the leading edge of this. We, um, at Amy, our lead informaticist engineer, learned about Fire probably three years ago. And we ran into David McCalley and been working with David and um, Sam Lampson in bringing uh, Visual DX into the Cerner uh, app store that Sam spoke about yesterday. So Visual DX is used by MDs, PAs, and NPs and residents at the point of care, and it's proven to reduce diagnostic error. It's proven to provide therapeutic speed to answer. And one thing we didn't realize how much use we'd get for um, Visual DX at the point of care for patient education. What we found was that the pictures are, of course, worth uh, thousands of words, and many of our users are sharing the screen with the patients as they work. And th I think the most important point is that Visual DX is actually used. And so this, this category of diagnostic CDS goes back about 40 years. Um, there's been some wonderful efforts, including here at MGH with DXplain and back to Intermountain in Salt Lake with um, probably pre-Intermountain with um, Iliad and Project in Pittsburgh QMR that some of you might remember. But universally, diagnostic support, which was really the original clinical decision support, has not been widely used. And so Visual DX is used, and I, I think it's because the imagery and dermatology is so difficult for emergency physicians in primary care. And so we use the imagery as a wedge to get the attention and fill a need with primary care. And so it's grown now to be used in over 1,500 hospitals and clinics. The largest client we have is the entire VA system has been using Visual DX for six years. And in it is 40,000 uh, professional medical images. So this is not a wiki model. We have relationships with leading universities and individuals. And we use the expertise of people in Rochester really to, to make sure that the images are really perfect professional medical images. And we're using SNOMED and RxNorm um, for our terminology. And when we speak to CMIOs and CMOs about what we do, we're talking about reducing diagnostic errors, increasing patient safety, physician efficiency gains, lower costs, enhanced patient engagement. So that's our value propositions. And there's some of our clients. We're actually in the little clinic, which is interesting. That's the in-store pharmacy chain retail clinic of the Kroger supermarkets. And so we're starting to see more care delivered in the little clinic and take care clinic. And we have to bring information to these NPs and PAs so they can provide superior care. So anyone here of the Institute of Medicine's report last fall on diagnostic errors, show of hands? Pretty good. So one of the statements the report made is that nearly every person will experience a diagnostic error in their lifetime. And so that means everyone in this room will probably be a victim of a diagnostic error. It's kind of a sobering thought to think about that. And so we created an iceberg to really uh, present this to quality and safety experts. And so since the To Air is Human report of 1999 by the IOM, the focus has really been above the waterline on surgical and medication errors, like dosing mistakes, like Dennis Quaid's uh, children had that unfortunate uh, incident after birth where they gave him the wrong dose of heparin, almost died. 
Um, and certainly the surgical, makes, uh, surgical mistakes make the news all the time. But when a patient comes into the office and a physician, a primary care physician or ER physician has to see 20 patients, say, in a day, and each one, and this is a little bit hyperbolic because, of course, patients come in this for their management of their hypertension and their diabetes. But if we, we say patients come in with symptoms and they say to the doc, I have a headache, I have dizziness, and the doc is operating primarily out of their brain, they're going to make mistakes. And so this infographic is really about this challenge of trying to address symptoms and chief complaints and do it accurately. And so we're living through this transition, and, and certainly my career has lived this transition. So when I was in medical school in the 80s, we had no computers, and we certainly had no smartphones. And really the paradigm is this memory-oriented paradigm where during the first two years of medical school, you're reading. Third year, you're apprenticing. Uh, fourth year, you're doing your electives. And the idea is that you'll be a great student, great resident, and you'll get it all in your brain. And then when the patient comes in, you're just an expert. You're, in, you're infallible every 20 minutes. Dealing with those symptoms, uh, being able to interact with their past medical history, their med list, and make the right decision, the right calls. And of course, that paradigm is really a flawed paradigm. It always was. And we had those manuals we had stuffed in our white coat. And we, sometimes we would refer to them. But really, the, the educational mentorship was really about the attending as the oracle. You know, you'd go on rounds, and you were expected to do this all out of your brain. And now, when I'm with my residents, what I say to them is, look it up. Don't present until you've looked it up and used information uh, in the literature to inform your decisions. And so now, thankfully, we're seeing the residents, they're often more facile than the teachers uh, with their smartphones and iPad minis and grabbing information from great, great resources. And we are actually try to model uh, acquisition of information at the point of care with the residents, uh, which is really a great transition from where we were just 20 years ago. But it's not universal. Of course, Medicine is not like aviation where every pilot performs the same. So you have some educators on one hallway teaching to the old paradigm, and then typically on the same hallway, one of the younger physicians is modeling information acquisition. So our passion really is the graphical representation of complexity. And so I just put up some a typical reference um, text-based analysis where you know, you're reading text on any of the online sources versus representing a diagnosis graphically. And in terms of Visual DX and Fire, we're using the Smart API and uh, Smart Fire standard to grab the patient's age, the sex, the problem list, and the medication list and invoking and launching Visual DX inside the EHR. And we were doing this with the HL7 info button standard for years, particularly in Epic. And the, we started having this question about, you know, how are we going to manage different resources in an institution? And there was an idea of an info button manager to handle uh, different uh, scenarios where there was more than one information resource at the hospital license. And we were hearing these questions about how is the hospital going to manage all these resources, hence my question of yesterday about governance of all these resources. And, and what FIRE, I think, offers, and, and particularly what Josh and others are working on with Hooks, is this idea that you'll have this little area on your interface that will tell you that the EHR has these external apps that have helpful information. And really the challenge is going to be how to evoke that and not cause alert fatigue. So we're, we're going very slowly. We're, we're very cautious about this problem of alert fatigue and giving poor results. So these are just some screenshots, and then I'm going to uh, try to fire up a little d demo. Uh, so this is from Cerner EHR. And you'll see the med list and the problem list uh, using fire. And when you click on a med, it will insert the med using the Rx norm code and give you the differential diagnosis of the adverse events. So this, this is not drug-drug interaction. What we're talking about is medication-induced disease or medication-adverse events. So for the non-clinicians in the room, 
medicines often trigger symptoms. And we've initially when we launched this, we thought that the physicians really, the clinical scenario was only, I want to check the med to see what the adverse events are. But we've learned from our users that they're often checking a med to prove to the patient that the med does not cause the problem that they think they have so that the patient continues taking the medication. So compliance is a, a real issue. And you know one of the problems is that patients have variable information from Google and WebMD. And as soon as they have a symptom, they're on the internet and they often discontinue their medication erroneously. So there's really two information needs and use cases around searching a med. One is no one can memorize all the adverse events to every drug. And so you tie a knowledge database of medication findings to disease relationships, and you allow a search using FHIR and launching from the med list so the clinician can answer that question of, does this medication cause this problem? And then conversely, doing that same type of search just to swivel the monitor to the patient and say, you see, I checked in this professional database and it does not cause the problem. And so here you see the, what we call the Symptacon view. And a little bit background, when Visual DX first launched uh, in March of 2001, it really was trying to bring dermatology to the ER and primary care. And then we moved to ophthalmology, oral medicine, and folks in, in the um, medical informatics space and in hospitals would see it, and they would see the images of rashes, and they would say, nice dermatology atlas, which really upset us because it was much more than an atlas. All along, you could put in your patient's symptoms, your signs, your country to see the infectious diseases if your patient traveled. And so there's actually this, this premature closure where people would characterize you by what they know, what, not what, by what they don't know. So in March at HIMSS, we launched the new Visual DX where you can search any chief complaint. So it's not just dermatology now. You can start with ataxia or diplopia or abdominal pain. And if there's no rash, if there's no visual, and you haven't searched by, say, vesicle or rash, it's going to take you to a Symptacon view. And so when you search... Here, the search was by uh, a blanching patch and a target lesion, and it brings up Lyme disease and southern tick-associated rash illness. And if I had searched by facial droop and, say, arthralgias, you wouldn't see photographs of the skin. You would see those symptacons, and you would still see Lyme disease at the top. So one of the key points about our work is that variation of the common is causing a lot more harm than doctors missing rare diseases. So all these wonderful diagnostic support systems really focused on, let's make sure they don't forget another case of Wilson's disease or something super rare, but really when you look at the, the numbers and you look at malpractice cases, when you, when you look at it, you see that diagnoses that are in error are things like um, stroke, MI, cancer, these are, the, these are the diseases that physicians are sued for. And it's, you know, any, any medical student knows that chest pain radiating down the arm with diaphoresis, think of MI. But what about a patient that's 64 diabetic that comes to an ER and says, I have a toothache? And we heard this case from an ER doctor just a few months ago. And so you can have an atypical presentation of an MI and miss it, and that's what's really burning physicians at the point of care. And so we have the, this flipping between photographs and diagrams, depending on what the search cues were in Visual DX. And there's handbook length text, so we're not trying to replicate what our partner up to date does. It's done a wonderful work over two decades of building this incredible textual knowledge base, but really focused on point of care information, what's the diagnosis? How do I test for it? How do I treat it? And we also rolled Visual DX out onto the iPhone right when the iPhone was launched. And that really was the game changer because, you know, the, the 
Workflow is not just the EHR. For many clinicians, either they don't like their EHR or their ER doctor on the go or a hospitalist, they're using mobile devices. So once we moved Visual DX onto the iPhone or Andro and then the Android, we really saw an uptick on our server in use. Now, a really uh, great partnership that we have with uh, Coveris, which is a Boston-based liability insurer that accredits Visual DX for point-of-care CME. So every search that you do is tracked if you're logged in as an individual. And then you can go back and you can uh, get a half a credit of CME for each search you did. And for any of the Coveris insured physicians, they give a discount on the liability insurance for using Visual DX. And this is the first instance of a liability insurer encouraging the use of point of care information technology. So uh, interestingly, the malpractice providers have for decades provided educational experiences to try to reduce risk in hospitals. So it's really gratifying that the liability insurers are starting to look at information technology to think, what can we do to assist better decisions at the point of care? And let me just see if I can do a quick demo. And here's the app in the app gallery. And we'll go to Anthony Coleman. So it evokes fire and then it represents the med list and the problem list the patient's on. And if you wanted to see, well, what are the side effects of lisinopril? You just click lisinopril, and it's going to launch this in a frame inside your EHR. And so when you search a med, what it's doing, if it's an internal problem, it's going to give you a symptocon. But if it's um, something that can represent with a photograph, it's going to give you photos. And you'll see that there's a little pill symbol. And we'll page down a little bit, see the spectrum here. You see that angioedema, so every, all the clinicians in the room know that ACE inhibitors frequently cause angioedema. So the pill with the number means the number of citations that are in visual DX, the evidence that that drug can cause that disease. And then if, if you wanted more information, we'll choose something else up here. So say you didn't know what pemphigus foliaceus is, you could click pemphigus foliaceus and go to more details. And you get to the text. And there's also a field called associated meds where you can get the alphabetical list of all the meds that's known to cause pemphigus foliaceus. And by clicking citations, you could toggle it to see which meds have the most citations as evidence that it triggers that disease. There's a breadcrumb navigation at the top. And there's also this spread view of imagery. So if I go here and I say, view all images, it shows me <clears throat> the spectrum of this diagnosis. So what FIRE does is it will, when Visual DX is not engineered like an online textbook. So there is a completely different set of pictures for children as opposed to um, adults. And I just saw the stop sign. So thank you. I'll be respectful of the stop sign. Thank you for your attention.